Yeah, so it's, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Professor Steve Heiner. He is a professor for computer science at the Columbia University in New York. Um, he's doing VR, AR, and wearable computing research for many, many years. For 25 years now, he's one of the pioneers in these fields. And um, Steve did his PhD at Brown University and co authored also one of the main computer graphics textbooks, computer graphics principles um, and practice. I think many of you know that book. Um, and it's really my pleasure to have you here, Steve, or not here um, live but remotely, uh, talking about AR or taking AR to task, explaining where and how in the real world. So, Steve, it's yours now. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be there, if at least virtually. I don't have a chance, unfortunately, to actually see you in person or to share a, a good meal with you. But at least I have the opportunity to talk about some of the research that my lab is doing. Uh, just to make sure, since it's currently muting the audio, is this still working on your end? Yes, it's still working. I just okay. put it on the microphone. That sounds great, because then I don't get to hear my voice with delay. Good. OK. So um, what I'm going to talk about, um, as uh, was already mentioned, is the notion of the kinds of things that one can do with AR, and for that matter, also VR, um, and even with displays that are really not VR, AR, very small, monoscopic, uh, wearable displays uh, that are directly relevant to performing uh, skilled tasks in the real world. And in my lab, we're particularly interested in the user interface aspect of augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, and wearable computing in general, um, trying as much as we can to work with existing hardware, existing underlying software, existing tracking technologies, and really concentrating on the user interface. This is something we've been doing for a number of years now. Um, some of our, our work has included uh, outdoor uh, uh, AR with back in the mid 90s a 45 pound backpack that has been completely dwarfed by um, even the smartphone languishing in the back of a desk drawer that was replaced a long time ago by your current phone and even the one before it. Uh, games and entertainment um, like in the middle this uh, view of me holding a patterned uh, board in my hand which is being tracked um, with uh, classical, uh, nowadays classical AR vision-based tracking to be able to make it into a virtual handheld marble maze. And the work on the right, uh, which is on task assistance, which you're seeing through an optical see-through uh, head-worn display, um, part of uh, the performance of a task uh, that involves putting the top part of an aircraft engine combustion chamber uh, onto the bottom part and then uh, attaching it. Um, and in this case, showing you overlaid a variety of meta objects that are used to explain to the person performing the task how to do it. So this notion of task assistance is what I'm going to be concentrating on today. And I'm going to start by telling you a bit about something that we've been doing, especially over the past couple of years, which is looking at remote task assistance. So this is not so much the system itself determining what to tell you and uh, how to, to tell it to you, something we've been doing for, for many decades now, but rather what happens when somehow whatever automated approach you have, even classical paper documentation fails because it doesn't actually tell you what to do in the specific situation that you're in right now. Let's say something is broken, or you've encountered perhaps a problem that, that doesn't seem to be one that is properly uh, explained in the manual. And so the scenario that we're interested in is one that we're showing you here in this little sketch. It's the idea of a local technician who is the boots on the ground, getting ready to actually perform a task. And we'd like them to be advised by a remote subject matter expert who as in industry is often known as a SME for short. And the idea is that nowadays there are plenty of situations in which uh, in order to fix something or to maintain something or even install something, uh, someone may get flown by thousands of miles away 
to a particular place where it needs to get done because the people there don't actually know how to do it. Um, and we'd like to see is there some way of being able to allow that person to advise remotely a way that would be better than simply having them talk via phone, better than having them FaceTime or the equivalent, uh, better than having them simply scribble perhaps um, in a way that's captured in 3D and then positioned uh, in the environment of the local person. We'd really like to have that remote person be able to demonstrate things that are actually 3D, that uh, have interesting motions in terms of the ways in which uh, their body and the objects in their environment move to be able to explain to someone how to do something. So the way we see it basically is there's two main goals that we're interested in helping our SME accomplish. The first one I'll, I'll talk about is being the where goal. We'd like to get the local technician, whom I'm going to call the tech for short, get into the right place, be positioned and oriented in the right direction to actually accomplish the task. And the second thing we'd like to do is to then help the tech perform that task. So this is essentially the where, rather the how, complementing the where that I just mentioned. So let me begin by telling you a little bit about one particular approach that we took to trying to do this back a couple of years ago. Um, and what you're seeing here is a still from a video that I'm going to show you. Um, and in the still, you're seeing the track hand of the uh, remote uh, expert um, at the lower right. And the hand is basically pointing at uh, a scale model, um, maybe, oh, not quite a foot across uh, in size, of an aircraft engine that we actually have the full scale engine uh, in our lab. And you also see in this view um, at the bottom, uh, the rounded shape of a Lazy Susan, a little turntable uh, that's optically tracked to which this virtual model is attached, allowing that remote expert to spin it around to be able to look at it from any of a variety of points of view, which in real life, if they were there in the actual uh, site at which the repair is getting done, uh, they would actually have to walk all the way around this engine. So already we're trying to make the life of the SME, of the remote expert, as easy as possible. We're trying to make it very simple and fast for them to actually explain things. What you're also seeing in the view at the left um, is a little spear with a, uh, a pyramid uh, sticking out of it. And this, in fact, is a iconic representation, uh, a live a 3D iconic representation of the tracked head of that local technician relative to the engine. Our local technician and our remote SME are both wearing tracked headwear displays. Now, the SME's hand is also uh, intersecting this little iconic representation uh, in red of a particular position and orientation that they would like the technician to get into. And the idea is you see several of these icons which are sticking out of uh, that uh, scale model of the engine. And these represent particular places that would be good to do particular things at if you were that local technician. They could be good places to view potential damage from, good places maybe to be if they're being asked to uh, do something in the environment. So this is basically a still of what our remote SMEs world looks like. And when they select that um, iconic representation, we'll now see what in terms of a still, our local technician sees. At the left, you can see a view of uh, that physical engine that's actually in my lab. And at the right, you're seeing um, a very simple virtual representation that looks very much like um, a, a displayed um, picture frame window. And essentially, we're going to ask the technician to walk up to and look through that window. And the idea is this is supposed to give them an idea of where they're supposed to be in the environment uh, to perform the task. So let's actually see a little video. This uh, looks like it might play rather choppily because of the load um, that Hangout is placing on my machine. Um, so uh, this does not normally run at the speed when it's running live. So here you're seeing our remote expert spinning that little turntable. Now you're looking through one of the eyes of the expert who's wearing a uh, VR display. 
and they're looking at this engine and now you're going to see them select one of these locations and here we see our local technician wearing a Canon HMA1 video see-through display and now you're seeing how they got to be, to be told how to get there and this is that picture frame window they're going to put their head up to look through it and when they do that now you can see the hand of the SME with a long kind of Pinocchio nose pointer attached to their finger to allow them to point at a specific place that they would like to have the SME do something, excuse me, the, the technician do something with. Um, so this is one way of being able to let that technician know where to go. Now it turns out there's actually a problem with this approach uh, that we discovered when we tried it with different people. And that's that different people have different attitudes, different responses to being told to look through that window. There's some people who will boldly go up to it and literally stick their head right through it. There are other people who perhaps are the folks who like to go to museums and know if you get that close to a painting in a frame like that, the guards gonna get very angry with you. And so they keep a respectful distance a bit further back. So there's a very wide range when we tell the people what to do when you show them in, uh, a visualization like that. And so what we want to do, thinking about this, was to come up with a, a way that would enable us to have more precision about what we wanted to have the person do when looking at stuff. But we did not want to literally give them, for example, a representation of a graphics uh, frustum uh, saying, have your eye exactly at this point, look in exactly this direction. Because while that kind of, of precision works very well for certain tasks, ones that require you be in a very precise place, like for example, a bore sighting task, looking through a microscope, let's say, it doesn't work well for a lot of other tasks. Ones in which you have a range of, maybe even a very large range of good places you can be, uh, a large range of good orientations um, in which you can be looking. And so in order to be able to capture this notion, kind of like uh, a fuzzy version of a frustum or a, a more liberal version of a frustum, we developed what we called a, a parafrustum. And the parafrustum um, has uh, a definition mathematically and has several different ways to visualize it. I'm showing you here one visualization that ended up working very well in a study that we did. Um, and this one basically starts with this third party view in which you're seeing uh, one of the members of my lab, um, Carmen Alvesio, wearing this video see-through display He's seeing in front of him something that looks very much like the airbag of, of an automobile in the process of being deployed, this big sort of puffy thing. And that big thing is what we call a head volume. In the implementation that we've done, it's an ellipsoid. And that head volume has a particular size, and shape, and orientation. And depending upon how big it is, and where it is, and how it's oriented, it's more or less easy to get into. It's more or less big. And the task, the first task you have is get your head into that volume. And the idea is if it's a big volume, you're going to have a fair amount of leeway as to the position of your head. Um, if it is a smaller, tighter volume, you're going to be much more constrained. And getting our head in it turns out to mean getting both eyes of the head into the volume. And in the case of this video see-through display, the stereoscopic video see-through display, it means getting both of the cameras of the display, both of their centers of projection, into the volume. And this turns out to be a relatively easy task, made more difficult only, as I said, by the particular size of the volume for a person to do by ballistically trying to, to get their head inside. Now, once their head is inside, we need to constrain how uh, it's oriented. And that's the task of the tail volume, which you can, I hope, make out uh, at the lower right-hand corner what you're seeing there is instead of being fully shaded, it's literally just shading around the limb of another little ellipsoid. And you also can see a set of bluish ribs, uh, striped ribs, that connect together the head volume and the tail volume. And it turns out that they basically are part of the convex hull that bounds those two volumes. They're the parts of the hull that are not um, uh, do not involve any surface of the, the two ellipsoids. And we're rendering them basically as this, this set of striped uh, ribs. 
So how does this work? Let me show you a couple of stills from a video that I'll show you shortly. Um, and here we're looking at six stills. The first one shows a somewhat different volume at the upper left. Um, this is a uh, view through one eye of our uh, video see-through display being worn by our uh, local technician. And in the next still, our technician has gotten a lot closer uh, to that head volume. You can see the tail volume, the rib is the head volume. And at the upper right, they've actually got their head inside of that head volume. And once you're inside and once the tail volume is fully visible within the frustum, and actually since it's stereo, it needs to be fully visible in the intersection of the two frusta, we want to have it seen by both eyes fully, um, then those ribs are going to disappear. You'll see still that very faint outline. And then as long as that constraint is maintained, both eyes inside the head volume, um, the tail volume being within the intersection of the two frusta, then the ribs will stay away, the tail volume will have just its small outline, and depending upon the sizes, you'll have a fair amount of or very little slack in terms of how you can move. In the interest of making a video to explain this, we show you what happens if you put your head into the tail volume, head volume rather, and then go out the other side, which of course can happen because there's no physical constraint. So when you go out the other side at the lower left, you're going to start seeing the ribs reappear. Um, the limb starts uh, illuminating a bit more brightly. As you get even further um, out of the head volume, that tail volume gets brighter and brighter red, telling you basically you've gone too far and moved back. And if you then start intersecting the tail volume with the sides, the top, bottom, left, right, if the tail volume is fully inside, that's good. If the tail volume is intersected by only the right but not the left, or only the left but not the right, or only one of the top and bottom, that means that you really could get more of the tail volume inside. It either needs to be totally inside or it has to be cut off on left and right, or cut off on top and bottom. So we have a kind of heuristic based on that for maximizing, uh, although not really mathematically maximizing, the amount of the tail volume that's visible in the head volume. Because sometimes there are things that will fit, sometimes there are things that are simply too big, and therefore, if it's too big, we want you to at least and not have it cut off on one side of left and right, or one side of top and bottom. So you're seeing these white lines around the edges over here, indicating in the visualization that this is being cut, in this case, by only one of top and bottom, only one of left and right. And then on the right, um, you can see just that faint outline of the tail volume because we pulled our head back inside the head volume and we'll now be able to look at it. And we're looking at it from a good one of a set of possible good positions, a good one of a set of possible good orientations. So having given you that long-winded explanation, let me actually show you a video shot through one eye of the video see-through display. And so now we're seeing what it looks like from the standpoint of this local technician. They're sticking their head inside. That yellow filmy look goes away. The ribs are gone. Everything's fine. But for the interest of the video, they're sticking their head way, way too far through. It's glowing that angry red. You're seeing it being cut, you know, on only one of the left, right, top or bottom. And now they're going to pull their head back. And now everything is fine. You can see we have a range of positions and orientations we can look before we then pull our head out. Um, and so it turned out, you know, having developed that technique, we looked at different ways to visualize it. Um, we uh, compared uh, the quality of those visualizations with each other. We looked at very tight versions of a parafrustum with tight constraints on position, tight constraints on orientation that in the limit really would correspond to giving you a classical graphics frustum with a very tight constraint uh, on the uh, look uh, from position and uh, in on the look at direction. And it turns out that people actually did better with this particular visualization than with other ones. And as well, unsurprisingly, we managed to show that when we gave you very tight constraints, that it took longer uh, for you to assume uh, them than when we gave you very loose constraints. The deal being that in situations in which we don't need to tell you very precisely exactly where your head needs to be, exactly the direction in which you're being oriented, 
rather than give you a particular example of such an exact specification, we can give you this more general um, one with more slop in position, more slop in orientation, and have you get to where we want you to go more quickly. So now we've gotten to where we want you to go. Now we have to actually perform the task. So I'll talk about one approach that we've taken to doing this, allowing our remote expert to go and show the local technician what to do. So this is the third party view of uh, one of my students, uh, actually now former students, Mengu Sakan, um, looking at the task domain um, of a bottom and top portion of this aircraft engine combustion chamber. And what he sees, this being shot through this Canon uh, HMA1 video see-through display, uh, is this. And what you're seeing here is at the lower right, lower left rather, is the physical uh, bottom portion of the combustion chamber. At the lower right um, is the physical uh, top portion of the combustion chamber. And then on top of that actual bottom portion, you're seeing a, uh, a cloned copy, uh, a virtual copy of the top part of the combustion chamber, which has been placed in position and orientation by the remote expert. Uh, the remote expert is talking with, we assume that there's voice communication with the local technician, and each one of the pieces um, of uh, the task domain is being tracked in position and orientation as well. Uh, for those of you who have used optical mocap systems like Vicon or Natural Point, you'll probably recognize those little retroreflective spheres that you can now see studying um, these physical parts we're using this particular technology to be able to go and track um, each one of the pieces of the task domain along with the heads of the uh, local technician and the remote expert and the uh, tracked uh, hands are actually tracked uh, handheld uh, controllers that are being used by the remote expert as we'll see in a couple of seconds. So we're seeing a view of this in this case, with additional meta objects, uh, rubber band lines being drawn from a place or three places on the top, um, a real portion of the combustion chamber, and three places, corresponding places on the bottom uh, part of the uh, physical combustion chamber on the left. And then on the right, you're seeing uh, another still image of the physical combustion chamber top now in the hand of the local technician being moved into place, uh, guided by what the remote expert did. So what does this look like? Um, local technician in AR, uh, video see-through, remote subject matter expert in VR. So you're seeing basically corresponding views that these folks see. We're doing this in VR for the remote uh, expert because what we really care about are the actual uh, Task domain objects. We're assuming that our remote expert is actually in a scenario in which they have none of the real objects. One of the things that's very interesting to us is the idea that that remote expert who might have gotten that way by literally being with a company for many, many decades might be interested in retiring. And we're trying to see what kind of offer might we make to someone who simply wants to stop working, but that would be an offer they can't refuse that would get them to maybe continue working for the company. So we imagine the idea that you could tell someone, we'd like you to work for us even though you're retired, but first of all, you don't have to come into the office. You can work at home, forget about nine to five, you work whatever hours you want to, just give us a little bit of advance notice. Um, you don't have to have any of those greasy things that would be part of the actual task domain uh, in your home, because of course you don't want them there. Everything will be virtual. Um, you'll be wearing a nice state-of-the-art um, head-worn display, maybe a nice optical see-through, a video see-through display, or a VR display. And, oh, you don't have one? Don't worry, we'll buy you one, and your grandkids can play with it when you're not using it. So we think at a certain point, when you add in the fact that, that of course, you're getting paid for this as well, that a lot of people will find this very appealing. And uh, just as this would benefit a company, having that kind of challenge when you want it, of actually being able to solve tasks, tasks that you have had decades worth of experience doing, you know, can, can be emotionally very satisfying 
and also can keep a person lively and alert and and not literally have them essentially deteriorate the way that a lot of people do when they no longer have things that that need to get done that require that they think carefully about them. So let's see what this looks like from the standpoint of a SME. One thing I, I should now mention to you is because we are actually capturing all of those um, physical parts, we can now make in the SME's world this sort of uh, virtual copy, uh, digital twin sometimes it gets called in industry, of the actual task domain. And now our SME can interact with that task domain by looking around, uh, grabbing hold of objects and moving them. But we have a problem. If the SME grabs hold of one of these virtual copies, it's being manipulated because it's tracked by the technician, then, well, who wins, the technician or the SME? Um, the technician has the physical part. The SME doesn't have any way of robotically influencing that part. And we don't want to have the SME grab hold of something and then suddenly it's out of sync in terms of its position or orientation relative to the domain. So what happens is when the SME grabs hold of something, you're going to see it get cloned, and then they're going to be controlling this second copy, which will then be visible in the world of the technician. So let me show you a little example of this happening. Here we're seeing our SME wearing a tracked headwear display. This particular version of our system was done a couple of years ago before the... Um, spate of modern, um, relatively inexpensive, relatively wide field VR displays. This one is an older Sony display um, uh, from uh, a couple of years ago. And our SME in this case is holding a tracked mouse, which they're using to be able to reach out and grab these virtual objects. So here we're gonna see them do that. As they grab that copy of the top, you'll notice a copy gets made which they can again manipulate in place, clutching and declutching to be able to control its position and orientation while they're talking to be able to also say, move it like this, you know, move it really slowly, move it really quickly, slow down when you get over here as I'm doing, et cetera. So here we go back to our technician. Um, the same uh, idea of the technician seeing um, what the SME is, is doing. Um, here is that a copy of the a top portion of the combustion chamber. And when I start the video, you're gonna see that top portion moving a little bit. The SME still has hold of it. They're still trying to get it into place. Um, you're gonna see it move a little bit in position, rotate a little bit. And an interesting point is the technician can, can actually start performing their task of matching what the SME is doing, even while the SME is still doing it. Which is interesting because if this were happening in real life, with the SME physically being there, and the SME didn't have these kinds of virtual tools, but maybe actually had the physical top of the combustion chamber, and was showing you how to do that, in order for you to try, they would have to remove the combustion chamber physically from the top to give you a chance. But with the virtual copy, the SME, the technician can actually be guided by it because they actually see it in place. So this we think of as being an advantage over what you might think of the gold standard of really shipping that uh, SME to the task site itself. So let me uh, show you what this looks like. So here you're still seeing that top being manipulated into place. Now it's pretty steady. Our technician is getting ready to put it on. They put it in. And in fact, as they get really, really close, we just fade it out to avoid the confusion um, in video see-through of seeing the combination of both the real and the virtual one. So here we have our tech performing the task um, in AR. So in my lab, we come up with techniques like the ones that I've just shown you. We run user studies to get some sense of how well they work. And so what I'm going to show you now, basically, is, um, oops, let me get past that, is an example of a control condition that we were comparing this with. And our control condition was something that is very similar to what folks are starting to uh, sell uh, into industrial, real industrial applications. And this is a, a sketch-based uh, approach in which our SME is going to be sketching annotations on a tablet. Um, if you've ever seen um, the uh, HoloLens video that shows the father uh, showing his daughter how to do some plumbing tasks, the daughter's under the sink, 
the father's holding a tablet and he's literally uh, manipulating and pointing on that tablet to produce annotations in his daughter's environment uh, under that physical sink. So we're doing something very similar here. Um, our, our remote of SME is gonna sketch on the tablet. Um, the little scribbles they make um, are going to get sent, um, projected into the virtual representation of the scene. Um, so if they scribble on their projection of the top portion of the combustion chamber, that scribble will get then projected onto the physical combustion chamber top as seen by the local technician. And then when I start the video show going, you'll see what the SME is doing from the SME standpoint. You'll also see a little inset that will show you what the local technician sees. And then you'll see a combination of both that little scribble appearing in their environment. And you'll also see another thing, which is a representation as seen by the technician of the SME's head. Again, a very abstract representation, a sphere, a little pyramid sticking out of it to give you a notion of the direction in which their head is oriented. And what that will also let us do is have the SME say things like, I'd like you to put your head where my head is right now, which if they were physically present would not be possible, of course, because two heads can't be in the same place. Um, and even if you wanted to get them close to the head, you really want to be, you know, cheek by cheek next to some guy who hasn't shaved for a while and, you know, still smells from a really long flight. Probably not. And so here, having that virtual representation makes it very easy for you to literally be physically where that SME would like you to be. So let's see what this looks like. Here our SME, SME is sketching. Turning this around, you're now seeing just in the inset, the SME's view as they're scribbling some stuff. And now you're seeing as they're spinning this around, the SME's head, seen from the standpoint of the tech, the scribbles that have been placed actually on that top portion itself. So to make a long story short, um, we did a user study. I'm not gonna go into great detail over here, um, but we compared basically the condition that I showed you uh, just now as a control condition. We compared two different conditions that we had developed, one of which involved some sketching in 3D, one of which involved this demonstrational stuff that I showed you. Um, and our, our a task basically uh, in the study involved recruiting people as dyads, as pairs. We assigned one of them uh, as the SME, the other as the technician, based on a, um, uh, a spatial uh, abilities uh, test, uh, Vandenberg Cruz test that we uh, gave uh, the, each of these pairs when they were recruited. Um, this was a within subject experiment counterbalanced by the technique. Um, and we were able to show that the demo 3D approach was significantly faster than the other techniques, including this uh, sketching uh, in 2D technique that I showed you for the SME. Uh, that is to say, for the person having to do the demonstration, they were much better, much faster at doing this when they were doing things with 3D interaction rather than doing it with the 2D scribbling that I was showing you before. So let me move from this to another task. And now we're going to change gears in a couple of different ways. We're going to go from remote assistance by another human being to the system itself providing all the assistance. And we're going to go from a uh, optical or video see-through head-worn display to um, a small field of view, monoscopic, wearable. Um, in this case, it turns out to be a Google Glass Explorer edition. And so what we're looking at over here is um, a very different kind of, of hardware, one in which if I wanted to actually annotate the world the way that we were doing um, in the previous uh, piece of research, um, I'm going to have to be restricted to a very small portion of it. So I don't know how many, how many folks there have uh, actually uh, tried a Google Glass or some equivalent kind of small uh, monoscopic uh, eyewear. I don't think I can actually see you right now with this occupying my screen. So just sort of, have anyone there actually tried devices like that? Yeah, of course. Okay. And I assume some, maybe some of you haven't, but even if you have, unless you wear it on a regular basis, you might not remember how big that field of view is. So if you actually extend your hand full length in front of you 
like you might be able to see me doing, make a fist. And if you were wearing glass right now and you move that fist, you know, uh, in terms of orientation, you could move it so that the entirety of the glass uh, view, the entirety of the augmented view, literally would live within the projection of that arm's length fist. So we're talking about a very, very small field of view. Sadly, you will see papers, which people write about glass, where they show you pictures with someone with this really nice-sized virtual screen hanging in front of them. Um, and as you can see from, in fact, this little inset over here, this is shot with a camera through glass. You can see the size of that object, which you can see the entirety of uh, in the full screen view. You can see the size of the user's hand, and you can see the size of the view through glass. And that means that if we wanted to actually annotate the object itself, we could only annotate a little tiny portion of it at a time. And so instead of doing that in this work, we're actually showing a complete image, which in fact, that brightish uh, uh, geometric shape in the middle of uh, that view shot through glass, that is a small scale model of the object that my student is actually holding in his hands on the left over there. So this is somewhat different from more classical AR in that rather than overlaying the virtual stuff in a way that registers it with the real stuff, the view shot through this uh, display is just like a page of a manual. And in this case, we're tracking that object using uh, optical tracking technology. So as the physical object is rotating in the user's hand, the virtual one will be rotating also along with the visualization that I will tell you about in a couple of seconds. So the task we're looking at over here, we're trying to pick a very simple one. This is a task involving orientation guidance. So the idea is our, uh, our subject has picked up um, this physical object in whatever orientation they like to pick it up in, and we would like to get them to orient it manually in their hands so it's basically facing in a certain direction. So it's oriented in a certain destination orientation. And so how do we visualize to them how we'd like them to do this? So I'm going to show you um, an actual view through glass shot with a camera through glass while a particular visualization is playing out. Um, I just want to get you, give you a sense of what this looks like. I will explain that visualization shortly. At first, it probably won't make a lot of sense but you will get a sense of the size of the field of view um, relative to the objects that we're looking at. So here we're seeing a person actually performing this task using a particular visualization that we've come up with. So you can really see that we, we can't really overlay the whole of this object with stuff. So we're making essentially this small kind of animated manual page. So in the work that we did over here, we had our task cut out for us. How do we show a person how to do this? We came up with a bunch of different visualization techniques. And what I'm going to do is to talk a little bit about a couple of them to give you a sense of what it is that we did. And we, we started by trying to think of all the different ways we could think of that would be potentially good ways to show this. And one way, the task being a task of trying to get you to take something in whatever current orientation you have it is, get it to a specific destination orientation, and so we're all geeks, we're all familiar um, with uh, work that was done quite a while ago by Lenhard Euler, well over 200 years ago, in which he proved that you could start from any desired orientation. If you had any desired destination orientation, that could be accomplished most efficiently with a single rotation, provided that you get to specify what that axis is. It has to be about a very specific axis. So we figured, gee, you know, we're geeks. Let's actually try that. And we called it single axis, optimal rotation about one axis. And the visualization that we came up with, and I'll show you this running in a couple of seconds. We see some stills over here. We basically had our axis be represented by a sort of striped barber pole-like cylinder. Um, you can see a little scale version of that uh, object at the center pierced by the cylinder. The direction and magnitude of the rotation um, is shown by a set of dynamic curved arrows. You'll see how they move in a couple of seconds. Um, and they're 
basically they live within this band that goes uh, about um, the object itself, um, about the axis. Uh, this is all continuously updated based on the track pose of the tracked object. And we had to make sure to make the visualization work well that the arrow tip, um, at least the tip of the frontmost arrow, was always going to be facing the user so they could see it. Okay. Um, it turns out that this, or what you might think of as being an optimal way to do it, would be really optimal if you were a robot with really good uh, tracking and, and good uh, end effect or control. But as a human being, making a person rotate something about an arbitrary axis freehand can actually be kind of hard. So let me show you what this looks like. This is a person actually doing the task. They're trying to rotate. You can see the arrow slowly getting eaten away. And when they succeed, we turn the object green to let them know that they've done it. They see the green for a, uh, a couple of seconds. And then in the study that we did, they would move on to another task and another task and another task, etc. So that's one approach. Let me show you another one. This is one that we also thought could work well. This we called animate. And the idea is there's an animated replica that represents the remaining uh, portion of the rotation. It will start with whatever current orientation you're at. It will rotate itself um, in the optimal um, way to the destination um, uh, orientation. Um, it will then uh, pause for a fraction of a second. In our case, it was a half second. And then it would do it all over again. And then basically the frequency with which it did this, in fact, increased as you got closer and closer to the target pose. Um, so we put a lot of effort with these visualizations and trying to not just make something that fulfilled a particular approach that we thought would work, but to try to really do a really, really good version with lots and lots of uh, uh, studies, uh, pilot studies, and lots and lots of, of formative evaluation, trying to go and get this to be as good as we could do it. Let me show you what this looks like. Here you can see the one controlled by the user. You can see that ghost view animating towards the destination. And now they've actually gotten it, and it ends up turning green. So let me tell you about the final one. After having done all the ones that we could sort of think about in advance, we tried to see, could we actually do better by, by really trying to concentrate on what was going to work well? We liked the idea of making a person do that optimal rotation, but we found that actually showing you the axis and showing you a copy of the object didn't really work as well as we thought that it might. And so what we came up with is something we call handles. And you're seeing static views of it over here. We have two dynamic control icons, the so-called handles. They look a little bit like a barber poles. They're cylinders. They stick out of the object. They have a little rounded sphere uh, at the end, very high visibility. They're two different colors, blue and red. We have two stationary target icons, um, which are little toruses, little rings. They always live on a horizontal line. They always are in front of the user um, in the locations that you're seeing them uh, in these three stills. And the task, as explained to the person doing this, is you need to get those handles to be inside the rings. Red needs to be in red ring. Blue needs to be in blue ring. How you do this is up to you, and to help you, we actually are drawing a little line of arrows from the blue handle to its ring, from the red handle to its ring. And if you actually trace the paths of those arrows, you, in fact, <clears throat> will actually rotate the object about that optimal axis, but we're not showing you the axis. Now, you could try to do it that way. On the other hand, you could say, gee, the destination goal is to simply have each handle in its respective ring. Let me get the blue handle in first. That seems to be the easiest. And then let me get the red handle in. If the blue handle goes out, that's OK. As long as we're done, both handles are in. Um, or you could start with the other handle. Or you could you know, sort of successively walk the blue a little closer, the red a little closer, blue a little closer, red a little closer. Or as you get better at this, you can really try to move them both smoothly at the same time, which if you really do it exactly, will in fact correspond exactly to rotating about that uh, optimal axis. So the difference here, in other words, is not so much in the end result and in the way to get there, 
but what we show the user and the actions that what we show the user encourages. So let me show you what this looks like. Here we have a still image of that object with these handles poking out of it. The arrow is showing you the trajectories that optimally you should be taking. And this is what it looks like from the standpoint of our user actually doing it in one trial. And when we succeed, you see the thing actually turns green. And uh, success for us actually doesn't involve exact success because that's very hard with a freehand object. In the study we did, success meant essentially being within uh, eight degrees of being exactly on target. We considered that to be success. So let me tell you briefly about a user study that we did, single session study uh, within subject, counterbalanced by condition. We had additional um, conditions that I didn't show you. We had one that was based on the classical uh, Euler angles. Uh, so you would have three rotations, and that way, rather than this arbitrary axis, we could make the axes correspond to the principal axes of a particular object, which for many human-made objects, um, they're pretty obvious what those principal axes are. And then we had one more, which we considered our control, and in that you saw an animated version that you were controlling in one portion of the screen, you saw a static representation of the target in the other, and that was it. You simply, on your own, were, were tasked with getting that controlled one to match up to the target orientation. Um, so within subject, uh, counterbalance conditions, um, uh, acceptance threshold that I mentioned, um, all this running in Unity on glass, um, and there we have our study. So I'll digress for one second because I think it's kind of interesting. Um, glass is, does not have a particular powerful processor, especially the, the Spore edition that we were using. Um, running Unity on glass, if you've ever actually tried this, um, shall we say heats glass up really, really fast. And it heated it up so fast that during the course of the study, we ended up deciding based on, on pilots that it simply would not work reliably. And so we ended up using something that Unity has uh, called remote mode um, in which you are actually running Unity on um, a regular normal desktop or laptop. It's shipping its visuals out um, essentially as uh, images. Um, uh, motion uh, JPEG basically um, to uh, glass um, and it's using all the sensors on glass um, to control the program running on um, the remote physical normal Windows desktop. Even then it turns out that still gets glass somewhat hot and so in the study itself before a participant would put glass on Glass was sitting in a, a freezer a temperature cooling gel that cooled it down to be a really, really frosty temperature. So when they actually put it on, it would be able to last to the end of the study uh, uh, that they were doing. And in fact, when we actually did this ourselves um, in the testing process, which would often take longer than the study, we would actually wear one of these uh, migraine headache uh, ice uh, cold freezer gel packs uh, bound around glass itself just to do some uh, uh, super cooling. So let me give you an idea of the results. It turned out that handles was significantly faster than the other techniques. But interestingly, if you looked at the first portion of the task, in which people tended to be much more ballistic. They moved very quickly at first, and then they kind of fine-tune, slowing down, which is true of, of many, many tasks of that sort. If you only looked at the first portion, the animate approach, which actually is a very nice approach, was essentially statistically um, uh, not significantly different in uh, speed from the handles approach. And you can see that by the orange portion of the bars over there. It was only when we added in the fine-tuning that the fine-tuning itself uh, handles was significantly faster, and the sum of fine-tuning and uh, ballistic, that is to say, the entire time that it took to do it, uh, we actually had a significantly faster time for handles relative to animate. 
So let me actually show you what this looks like now in a real stereoscopic AR. Um, this was a uh, HoloLens implementation that we did where you can actually now see the handle sticking out of the physical object itself. So here's what it looks like. As a user holding this uh, box, this is tracked using Euphoria um, to orient the box to the desired orientation. Again, what I probably neglected to say is, why would you want to do a task like this? Uh, there are many examples in maintenance, repair, assembly, in which some object needs to be oriented to a specific orientation before it's inserted in something else. There are also tasks in which I'm looking at something, trying to see, let's say, a barcode or some kind of a, an inventory sticker, which may be placed at some location that the system knows about, I don't know about. And rather than making me have to like literally look over the entire object to find it, what if I could do it really quickly? That would surely speed things up if I had to look at a lot of objects in succession to find and say record and verify the number. So having told you about those two pieces of work, I want to close by talking about uh, something else. And that is that I'm a great believer, as I hope you have already gotten the idea, uh, in the future potential of the kinds of eyewear that we'd all like to have. Lightweight, inexpensive, high resolution, really wide field of view, um, self-contained processor that, that dwarfs anything that you would use in a lab nowadays, hooked up with incredible uh, quality um, and, and performance uh, radio to other devices. Um, oh, and did I add things like um, uh, selective opacity per pixel and uh, really high contrast and make it a light field while you're at it? You know, all those things that we'd love to have and that we will have at some point. I just can't say when. However, I believe when we have that, that all the other displays in our lives are not gonna go away. Um, those 55 inch diagonal uh, displays on your wall, they may go away, but they're gonna be replaced by having wallpaper or paint that will be a display. Your carpet will be a display. The, in every available surface will actually be a display. So from my standpoint, I'm interested in what can happen when all these things are displays? How can we synergistically use the head-worn displays that can give us very private stuff in conjunction with all these other displays and devices in the world? So you're seeing one still from one example of this um, that we've done in which you're looking at a first-generation Microsoft Surface back when they used that uh, phrase to refer to a rear-projected uh, tabletop uh, display. Um, and you're seeing a portion um, uh, on that display of uh, the uh, urban infrastructure of downtown Manhattan. Uh, on the display itself, you're seeing the footprints of some buildings, but you're seeing buildings that are now in 3D violating the bezel. They're going beyond the bezel of the display. We all know that's impossible. This is the kind of view people often show you when they're giving you an ad for a stereo display. They show you things coming out of the monitor in ways that they just can't, because if they didn't do that, it wouldn't look like a stereo display unless they showed you double images, in which case it would look weird to anyone who was looking at the picture in a non-stereo advertisement. So the reason we can see those buildings violating the bezel is that this image is shot through a video see-through display looking at that Microsoft Surface multi-touch display, and the video see-through display is responsible for showing the buildings. Both displays are working in a common coordinate system. And the idea of displays and devices talking with each other, working within the same shared coordinate system, is a way I like to think of this world of future displays, future devices all around us playing out. They all know about each other, and they all work together in the same shared coordinate system. So let me show you an example of this. This is a, a very different task domain, unlike that urban infrastructure one. This is a music exploration one. This is work that was done predominantly by Pierre Amelot, who is a, uh, a student um, um, at, um, um, at Cole Polytechnique um, uh, in uh, Paris, who was a uh, visitor in my lab for a couple of months. And in this work, we worked with a combination of technologies, 
HoloLens to be an AR headwear display, a perceptive pixel multi-touch display, 55 inch diagonal, multi-touch forerunner of Microsoft Surface Hub, um, and the Leap Motion controller that I'm sure there's probably many of in pretty much any uh, lab doing this kind of stuff uh, in the country. So how can we make all these things work together? So what you'll see is a little demonstration of a, a task in which this is actually happening. Um, I'm hoping that the audio from um, the uh, system will actually play on your end um, when I start it up. So here we're seeing our viewer, our user, looking at a collection of representations of artists. There's Michael Jackson. Now you're seeing this shaft of light appear above his head with his albums in it. You can now spin this around again. Pick Daft Punk. Again, courtesy of the coordination of the coordinate systems, shaft of light is above that. Now the gestures being done are not HoloLens gestures. HoloLens does only one hand at a time. These are two-handed leap motion controller gestures, all again working in the shared coordinate system. And now we can reach out, grab, rotate. These are things you can't do with what HoloLens supports. Pull that out, make it a little bigger. Back to HoloLens, which is interpreting the audio. And now we're talking to Spotify to be able to go and get the song to actually play as the user continues to look around and do stuff. So I'm going to stop that at that point. And so now what I want to do is to conclude. I've talked a bit about uh, AR for skill tasks in a variety of different domains. Uh, and what I'd like to do um, is uh, to thank the many students and colleagues that have participated in the research and the funding agencies that supported it. And I hope I have enough time left over to at least uh, be able to uh, answer some questions. OK, thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Who wants to start? Hi, Steve. This is Mark. Hi. Hey, Mark, give me one second. I'm going to try to see if I can disable screen sharing here. Um, and uh, I'm not sure I can do that. If I cover the camera, maybe that will make it so I can actually see what's going on. I hit screen share, and how do I turn it off? Um, at the bottom of the screen. At the bottom of the screen, I, I see you, but I don't see the thing that normally would tell me I can turn it off. Um, I see profile and mute. Um, maybe I just turn my camera off. Okay, that makes it a little better. Okay, and then I think I could probably try to see all of you. Maybe if I click on that, will that do it? Um, I see that, but I but I don't actually see the video view. No, now I do. Good. Okay, now it's working. So actually, Mark is out of the thrust room of the camera. You won't see him. Uh, okay, so I actually got out. If I put myself back in with screen, but how do I turn screen sharing off? Maybe it's off now, so let me turn the camera back on. Good, I think I succeeded in doing it. Mm -hmm. Great. I okay. See. Yes, hi. Okay, my question is, what are the major technical challenges you face in your research nowadays? I mean, the tracking is pretty good now, mm -hmm. the solution is improving, but what are the main like obstacles Okay, that's a great question. So yes, tracking is improving. It's pretty good for certain kinds of things. The, however, there's some things I'd like to do that tracking doesn't do. Okay, first, I'd like to be able to go and track arbitrary domain objects, even rigid bodies. And right now, everything that I've seen, including, well, I don't want to have to have markers on things, because the approach I'm using right now is really not realistic. Those things can't have markers on them for mechanical reasons. Even if I could put markers on them, you know, there's a lot of grease in that domain and greased up retroreflective spheres won't work well. Uh, anything that was active like diodes needs to be powered. Um, I want to track real models. And the problem is that everything that I have seen and tried maybe can track a model or two. Um, they, they're getting better and better. There was great work that came out of Nasir Nawab's lab that was at ISMAR uh, last week um, that was in the ISMAR proceedings that you guys may have seen already. Really nice stuff. 
but even then that does not track the number of objects I want with the reliability that I with my eyes can actually track them. Um, and I want to be able to do this with objects, both ones I might know about in advance and, and give full CAD for, and as well ones that literally are going to appear in my field of view for the first time. I can do it as a human being. It seems to me that that means it's not impossible and that we should be able to do it algorithmically. Now, if that's bad enough, I also want to be able to track squishy stuff. We are doing some work uh, in medical domains right now with things that are not rigid bodies um, and that move around um, and that expand. For example, when something gets excised, uh, the rest of the tissue might expand to take up the place of the stuff that was removed. Um, and then even with things I know about in advance, I want to track my hands. Um, in the work that I showed you, we had our remote SME holding that track device, moving it around, clutching it by pushing on the mouse button. That uh, paper took a lot longer to get out because I was really stubborn. I wanted to have the SME, who is not going to be a member of my lab, but a member of a recruited uh, population, come in and be able to have even one hand retract reliably. And the best things I can think of right now, leap motion controller, other things that are coming out of research labs, I can, my students can, do a very good demo shot in a single take where it looks like that hand is being tracked beautifully, right down to the fingers. Get a person in who's being paid their 10 or $15 and whose job isn't to make my lab and their research look good, they will move too fast, they'll move out of the frustum, they will do something, they'll just do this, right? And then that's all bets are off, right? You know, hand tracking does not work anywhere near as well as we'd like it to. And you can think about it, that's part of the reasons that HoloLens, you know, frustratingly to us, because we know how to use those hand tracking things, HoloLens is not going to track your hands. It's going to track literally that single little air tap gesture you know, and my moving my hand around, but not too fast, right? You know, I want to have real hand tracking and hap I'll happily give you a full model of my hands, right? Why can't I have something that will let me do stuff like this, right? And there's nothing I can think of that reliably does that right now. So I want that stuff. I want it now. I realize I'm not going to get it now. That's not the research I do, but I know there's plenty of folks who are working on that. And there's a huge bounty on the head of that kind of hand tracking and finger tracking, let alone, of course, the whole body being thrown in also. So that's one of the things I'd really like. Head-worn displays, yeah, they're getting better. My human field of view, with my head not moving, my eyes looking straight ahead, um, I actually have um, a healthy person has over 180 degrees horizontal field of view, even without moving your eyes. Uh, although, of course, in the periphery, things will need to actually be moving around a lot because you're very sensitive to high-frequency motion. Static hands out like this, with me looking straight ahead, I probably won't see them. I want that kind of field of view on a head-worn display. And I want a whole bunch of other things that we don't have right now, including that opacity per pixel thing, um, along with the resolution that won't look like a screen door, you know, all of those things are coming. Foveated rendering will help, but it's got to be good enough. We've got to track your eye gaze well enough that you don't see funny little uh, uh, artifacts uh, in the periphery when we're doing foveated rendering. So, boy, we're so much better than the things that people did 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. You know, Ivan Sutherland's first AR VR paper was published months shy of 50 years ago. That means that running in his lab a half century ago, you know, was a full-fledged, two different ways of tracking it, stereoscopic optical see-through display, never mind that just to go and do the clipping, I mean, that was research back then. So incredibly heroic stuff. We've had 50 years worth of progress, and it sure seems like we're making steady progress right now, but we're not really at the point at which we want to be. You know, and to take things further, I want the holodeck. I want to be literally transported into a place that I'm not, along with other people. I want to see them. I want to see all the virtual stuff. And like the ultimate display paper that Sutherland uh, wrote, actually gave us a talk in 1965, then wrote up as a paper later, 
I want to be able to walk into a place where I can sit in a chair that supports me that's virtual. Okay, think about the haptics involved in doing that. You know, a let alone, we're not talking about grounded haptics, by the way. <laughs> and I want to be able to, maybe I don't want to be able to do the rest of his very macabre story in which there are confining handcuffs that are virtual and he closes off with a fatal bullet that's virtual. <laughs> I prefer not to have that. I'd like the technology that would make that possible. I would like to have the uh, judicious uh, ethics <laughs> that would keep us from actually doing that. <laughs> so there's a whole bunch of things. Uh, I didn't even talk about the user interface portion that I'd like to be able to do. Okay, thank you. Sorry for the long-winded answer. <laughs> okay. Any other question? Question from my side. Being a pilot myself, uh -huh. I have a question on the remote assistant project that you yes. are talking about. Mm -hmm. I know that um, you know working on an airplane, ninety nine percent of things that you do can only be done by certified staff, and they know what they do. Mm -hmm. And now you're proposing to have maybe some less experienced technician being in on the site and a more experienced technician remotely assisting yes. this person. Is this something that the FAA would certify? Okay, so FAA, in other words, would you want to have a pilot who was not all that well uh, practiced? No, but um, I guess the FAA, just like the ASA in Europe, is also responsible for certifying technical stuff. It's not only. Ah, okay, okay. So I think, I think it depends on the task. For example, right now, um, you can fly a 747 without ever having actually flown one for real because the simulators are so good. Okay? But that's really getting you without assistance good enough. I think there are tasks in which you might actually not be a complete novice. You're actually pretty good at doing stuff. And as I'm doing something, and I'm pretty good at doing this, um, something happens. Uh, maybe um, something gets really badly damaged. It falls to the floor and it gets dented in a way in which, well, the documentation doesn't tell me how to deal with it. Maybe there's somebody who's remote who had that happen before, who has thought about it happening before, who, who, or who has 30 years worth of working with this stuff versus your five years worth of working with it, and having their insight could really be useful. I think about you know the astronauts who, when they encountered things, despite the fact that they were very highly trained, they encountered things that were unexpected, and they had a whole team on the ground trying to help them out. Now, the team didn't have these kinds of, of tools, but I think that there are tasks in which a remote expert with their hands and head able to go and let you see what they would do in your environment might actually be very helpful. Um, and there are things in which, like, for example, you know, someone trying to go in and cook or do some plumbing, let's say, where maybe they're doing this at an amateur basis. Um, they're not really going to be certified. Having someone expert a system for a short period of time and therefore not having to charge them a lot of money could be very helpful. But there really are tasks right now in which there are people who are supposed to be able to do stuff and who just can't do it. I've been told stories by people in industry about folks who say, gee, this thing you just shipped me, this very expensive piece of equipment, it's broken, it doesn't work, it gets shipped back to home base, and you know, it wasn't broken, it works fine. The person who was remote simply didn't know how to actually put it into play. And so that happens right now with people who really are supposed to be trained. Yeah. But at least uh, in critical areas like aviation, the, work, the way it works, at least for EASA in Europe, I think it's in yes. America the same. The only thing you're allowed to do as a pilot in, uh, with your plane is to wash it. You're not even allowed to lose a screw. If you want to do that, a certified technician has to do that. Any uh -huh. kind of things has, have to be done by a certified technician. And, uh, okay. They, uh, don't. I think that even if you're a certified technician, that doesn't mean that you know how to do everything equally well. And so there are some tasks that might be a bit unusual um, in which that certified technician could actually do it. They know how to perform all the low-level things. They just don't know which particular thing to do next, which bolt to remove next, 
They know how to remove bolts. They know how to, to, to tighten things with the right amount of torque. All those low-level things they can do, and it's something where if you had that expert on site, they could say, yeah, I think in this case, the best thing to do is to start by removing this particular piece over here. And that's something where I think someone who was already certified might be able to benefit in particular cases, maybe very unusual ones, from having that remote expert help them. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah. So um, I, um, I was wondering, uh, for the first uh, part with the SME, did you also uh, think of um, uh, adding additional information to the whole process that's, for example, technical drawings, so that you also get some, some uh, this additional context to, to the next floor, for example, this big engine. So you're looking, for example, at 2D projections that's done usually in CD, auto or whatever, and then use that also for the navigating. Because I was just waiting more or less that you would just mm -hmm. then have some drawing that the expert just uh, points at it on a tablet or something, and then it would just light up the, the location also on the on the real motor. Okay, so that's a good point. So there are certain things, especially ones that involve pointing, um, that are relatively easy for an expert to do. Um, and these are things for which some of those systems where there's a tablet, the expert simply needs to say, push this button. You know how to push buttons. The only question is which button to push. The expert circles it. The circle actually appears in the right place. Um, there is a, a nice piece of work that was done at UC Santa Barbara that got bought by uh, Euphoria that's actually being incorporated in Euphoria that does stuff like that. I think that can work very well for certain tasks. The test I showed you, um, the study that we did was done with experts who weren't really experts. So we picked a task that actually involved picking something up and rotating it into place, okay, as you saw before. It was a very easy uh, job of picking it up and rotating it, um, and that made it so that the people that we actually did that uh, study with, who were Columbia affiliates, who were not experts at that particular task domain, would be able to master it relatively quickly. There are other tasks that I think are a good deal more complicated. There may be, let's say, in plumbing, a task in which you need to tighten something with a big wrench. The wrench is kind of big. There's a lot of pipes. It may be that someone who has more expertise than you has a sort of a little secret. It's not in the manuals, but they know that in this particular situation, if you stretch your arm out kind of like this and kind of rotate it around like this, you can sort of like get that, that wrench through this little gap over here, and now you're able to get enough purchase on the wrench to be able to go in and rotate it. Trying to explain that, you know, by gesturing without having any real pipes in front of you um, can be really hard. And so that's the kind of thing where if the remote expert could be working with that virtual version, seeing their hand maneuvering that way relative to the actual physical pipes, that could make it a lot easier, let's say, for that local technician to do it. But having uh, additional things like a model, uh, rather a, uh, a 2D plan view, let's say, or elevation of a particular piece of equipment to point to, uh, those are all things that would make a lot of sense in that particular environment, but we're really trying to push on things that required more 3D interaction than simply pointing at a collection of names of things or a collection of pictures of things would require. More questions? And one last question from my side. Sure. The, the, the project with the handle user study uh -huh. sure. yes. did, you, did you experience a difference in the results for different object shapes? Uh, that's a good oh, that's question. Good. Yeah. For that particular one, um, we actually used a very small set of shapes, which were modeled after ones that were used um, in that Vandenberg who's uh, mental rotation test that we actually gave people to be able to figure out uh, something about their, their abilities before we actually did uh, the uh, the test. Um, uh, we did that as, as well, in fact, um, for the the dyads that we recruited for the remote assistance uh, test. Um, 
it turns out that many people, because we actually had the copy of the object appearing in the visualization, there were a number of people that instead of looking at the task domain itself, looked at that very small field of view visualization. That is to say, they didn't really need to even see the physical task domain, even though it was kind of within their field of view to begin with. Um, I believe that given that uh, all those visualizations have things like arrows, for example, and axes and handles, um, that we probably would not see a very big difference even in cases in which the object might have, for example, no distinguishing characteristics. For example, for rotation, a sphere, a featureless sphere, is the best example of something I can think of that there's no way you would know, you know, by looking at it, whether it was in the right orientation, right? Um, now, there may be tasks in which that sphere inside has some stuff in it, maybe a sensor that requires the sphere be at a particular orientation, Normally, to do that in a sane world, the sphere would have some kind of markings on the outside to help you orient it. Um, but we believe that with things like those handles sticking out, the handles provide the thing that you really are looking at. Um, and in the case of the glass version, the handles only appear on the inset visualization. However, in the case of the HoloLens version, the handles are really attached to the physical object. And so you can track the handles as you're manipulating it, even if the physical object does not have any distinguishing features. Mm -hmm. So that okay. was a long way of explanation. We, we have not actually tried with a lot of different objects to see what we would get. Okay. Okay, is there any more questions? If that is not the case, then thank you, Steve, again, very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Take okay. care. Goodbye. Okay, so thank you for coming. The next talk in November is on uh, 29th, I guess, by somebody who is here in person. Yes, from the University of So there will be more information on the website. I think this, this talk will be more about haptics, um, haptic interface. So that's what the research area is. Okay, thank you for coming.